Okay. Good morning and welcome to Encompass Live. This is a weekly webinar where we talk about all different kinds of things that apply or appeal to library personnel. And we welcome you all today, just a couple of days before the new year comes. This will be recorded and you'll be able to find that on the Library Commission webpage, which is the page that's up right now. I'm going to minimize this so it's Thank not you. in the way so much. And Richard Miller, <laughs> Director of the Library Development Department of the Library Commission, is giving the presentation today. And I'll just turn this over to him. Okay. Thank you, Sally. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about the Library Improvement Grants. And uh, I want to show you that we're on our main uh, web page here, our home page. There are two different ways to get to the Library Improvement Grants. Library Improvement Grants are funded by federal LSTA, Library Services and Technology Act, grant monies. And so there are some special provisions related to those as opposed to uh, state funding from the Nebraska State General Fund. Let's start out right away telling you how to get to the Library Improvement Grant information. There are two ways. You can either scroll down on the uh, website and you'll notice here that right here there's a sticky note, which if you click on it will take you to the page. But I want to go up here and show you another way of getting to it, which is go to the Grants. And then on that flyout menu, if you move carefully over to the right, there are the Library Improvement Grants there as well, and that's what we'll click on to take you there today. But either way, we'll get you there. All right. Now, we're going to start off, uh, if you look at the bottom of the page, there's a list of all the current links for the Library Improvement Grants, and we're going to start with the one from Rod Wagner, the grant message from the director, which will be down here. So you can just click on that. That's a live link. Is there any way uh, the bottom, that, that bar at the bottom there, drag it. to the right so we can get over it. Thank you. Sweet. So we can look at that page. And um, this is a message from Rod Wagner, our director, in which he announced these grants on December the 4th. And uh, notice, first of all, this due date. This is coming up, folks, January 28th, uh, 11.59 p.m. Central Time. These things have to be in. They're all online. We don't want any paper grants. That won't be acceptable. So keep that in mind as we go through the whole thing. All right. On this grants page where Rod announced these, there are a number of things that you need to be familiar with, some of which are repeated elsewhere, but I think it's useful to go through them uh, several times anyway. I mentioned that these are with federal LSTA grants. Because they're using LSTA grants, uh, we have to uh, have grants that respond to what are called LSTA purposes. You'll see that right there. Now, I've taken only five of the LSTA purposes because these seem to be most appropriate, and I've excerpted them. I didn't put all the full text here. If you want to see the full text, you can go down to our uh, five-year plan, and we'll go there just briefly. But I want to spend a little time talking about the LSTA purposes. If your grant application for your project does not fit within one of these purposes, then you probably shouldn't be applying for these grant monies because it, it won't it won't work. You won't be granted. However, as you read these, as you listen to them, you'll notice that they're pretty broad. You can drive a truck through some of these things. First one says, as the LST purpose, facilitate access to resources for the purpose of cultivating an educated and informed citizenry. I'm going to read these. I know it's not the thing usually to do, but I think it's useful to read them, uh, hear them orally as well as uh, in print. Second one, encourage resource sharing among libraries for the purpose of achieving economical and efficient delivery of library services to the public. The third one, promote literacy, education, lifelong learning, and to enhance and expand the services and resources provided by libraries, including those services and resources related to workforce development, 21st century skills, and digital literacy skills. The fourth one, ensure the preservation of knowledge and library collections in all formats and to enable libraries to serve their communities during disasters. And the last one listed is to promote library services that provide users with access to information through national, state, local, regional, and international collaborations and networks. Now, as I think back on the 88 public libraries that applied for accreditation this year, 
Um, I know that in their strategic plans, there were a number of projects and a number of goals that they have and outcomes that they're looking for that fit very well into these things. For example, um, if you want to have uh, teach some basic computer literacy courses, that fits very well into the, the third LSTA purpose up there. Uh, if you're interested in promoting business in your community or in promoting uh, better uh, economic development within the community, that would fit into some of these. So think beyond just reading these, these things here. Think about the, your strategic plans or the services that you already provide in the community or the services that you'd like to provide in the community as you do this whole thing. If you can think in terms of broader sort of things, like in terms of your strategic plan, in terms of what the library wants to do in the community, rather than just thinking, oh, I have to choose one of these and I have to follow lockstep what's going on. If you can think more creatively and more broadly about what it is you want to attain, then I think this process will be a little bit easier. It won't just be, okay, well, I've got to do this. I had to do accreditation and I had to do board certification, and I had to do library certification, and we had to do this strategic plan. If you can think of how these things relate to each other, you're going to have a stronger uh, project application form that you send in. All right, so those are the purposes. Let's click on the, the uh, strategic plan, the five-year plan that the commission has, and you'll notice when we go to this that if you scroll down to page five, you will see that that's where these LSCA purposes appear, and all of them are listed there, actually, and the full text of them are listed there also, in case you want to see the full text. That's just for you to look at. Okay, let's go back here. Now, in these grants, you will notice that priority is going to be given to those libraries, either public libraries or state-run institutional libraries, which we'll talk about later, uh, which are planning to join the Pioneer Consortium. We'll spend more time later in this presentation on the Pioneer Consortium itself, but there is a link there that takes you to the membership page of the Pioneer Consortium, which will offer more information, and we will review that later on. When I say priority, that means that if we have requests for more money than we have available, if there are Pioneer Consortium applications, they will rise to the top of the heap. So just keep that in mind. doesn't say that that's all we will fund, but it is a priority of the commission. All right. Notice on this page also, in this paragraph here, that these grants do require a 25% match. Now, that also requires at least a 10% cash match in this whole thing. The other 15% can be in-kind costs if you can make a case for them and so on. And you certainly can match greater than 10% cash if you have the ability to do that. Please do. That's fine. Then we won't have to haggle about whether this in-kind uh, match counts or not. If you have straight cash, that's great. Also, uh, you may not, just to be sure about this whole thing, you may not use other federal funds as part of this cash match. That's just not allowed. You can't match federal funds, which these are, with other federal funds. That's not allowed under the federal guidelines. Also, if you are uh, doing an internet-related project for this uh, grant application, you must indicate that you have applied and are involved in the E-rate process for telecommunications discounts or show that you are receiving uh, either the same discount that you would receive under the E-rate program, let's say a 60% discount, from your internet service provider or a greater discount is, a lot, is eligible as well. So that's uh, required as well. And I just want to tell you that for the Pioneer Consortium, because of how that grant has worked out, the libraries applying for that either may or may not be involved in the e-rate process. They don't have to be. That's not mandatory for the Pioneer Consortium because it's not an Internet-related project. It's by the definition that we're using for this. We hope that you do could, uh, participate in the e-rate program because of the discounts that you can get. But if you're not for Pioneer process, you don't need to worry about that. Richard, can people use um, state funds as a match? like their state, um, what's the word I want? 
State aid? State aid. If they wanted to designate well, that. Well, I'll tell you is, what. Is you, you, you can do that, but I think that would be... I would say that the ideal would be to you have, for you to have local funds, whether that's part of your budget or whether that's from a foundation or a friends okay. group or whatever, that would be preferable. But there's not a mandatory you can't use those funds. Okay. It's The reason I don't like that a whole lot is because let's suppose that they received a youth grant for excellence. Well, that's state money. Yes. Well, let's suppose that the project that they're talking about is related to somehow youth or children in the, in the community. I guess you could make the case that you have this money to match, but it's not really showing uh, a dedication on the part of the local library that they really they really want this and they're really serious about it. That's the reason for the match is to show that the local library and the community really cares about this. So good that's point. that's the best way I think to match it is with local funds. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a good question, Sally. All right. Let me um, go back to the SEPA compliance here, which is another thing. Uh, for those of you who um, were involved in E-Rate or have been involved in E-Rate for a long time, you know that SEPA compliance, Children's Internet Protection Act compliance, uh, was required. Well, for purposes of these grants, Again, if you have an internet-related uh, project that you're proposing, there is a, a SEPA compliance form that is appears on our website. I'm not going to go to that right now. That you have to print off and sign and send in in paper. That's the only thing about this whole process that you send in in paper. That again is if it's an internet-related project. If the project itself is not does not need to be SEPA compliant. You just check this is not a SEPA compliant project and you sign that and send that in as well. So that's the other thing we need to know about. I've already told you that the applications have to be sent in online. I'm going to go back here to our uh, main web page, go to the bottom again. And I'm going to go to, oops. No, I want to go back where it was. I want to go back here, sorry. This link at the bottom here talks about where you should click if you want to go to the application. This is actually not the application form. This is another page to, that I wish to talk to you about because there, although there are some things repeated on here, there's some things as well that we need to go through. You'll notice that this information at the top is pretty much the same. It has those same five LSTA, LSTA purposes from which you need to choose one or more as you go through this application. But I want to point out that there are a couple of other things on here as well. I already told you that accredited Nebraska public libraries are eligible. If you're not sure if your library is accredited, you can click on that and check. I also want to point out to you the, the list of 11 state-run institutional libraries that have uh, patients and residents libraries, which are also eligible to apply for this grant. It is rare when we see an application come in from the institutional libraries. I, if you're listening today or if you listen to this afterward, I am suggesting to you that this would be a really good thing for you folks to apply. I know you have particular hoops that you have to go through when you're applying and it has to go up the chain of command and whatnot, but these are meant for your institutional library residents as well. So please think about applying for this. All right. Let's look at what else we have here. This is a rundown of what is required from the applicant. We already talked about the 25% match, of which 10% must be a cash match. That's 25% of the grant amount. Sally has helped us figure this out over the years since this 25% or 10% has caused difficulties in the past. So to 25% and 10% of the cash of the amount that you're requesting for the grant. You have to meet all the requirements, and there will be some documents that we send you uh, to respond to as well. I guess there are some other paper documents, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, the SEPA compliance is there. The E-rate compliance is there. And this last one I want to talk to you about has to do with the ADA compliance. That is the Americans with Disabilities Act. If, you're, um, if your project is getting some technology in your library, you better make darn sure that it is ADA compliant. And there is a link here 
which we're not going to go to today, but I encourage you to go to it, which talks about two lawsuits that occurred at Sacramento Public Library and at the Free Library of Philadelphia, which is the main uh, public library there in Philadelphia, that were brought by visually impaired people because both of those libraries got the idea that they were going to buy ebook readers and make them available to their, their patrons. But they didn't buy accessible ebook readers. They just bought regular ebook readers. And uh, uh, a visually impaired group, I think it was NFB, National Federation of the Blind, brought suit in both cases. And you can read the results of that whole thing. And it's useful because there's some useful information in there of what these two libraries did in order to comply with those those suits. It's really very useful information. So even if you're not applying for a grant that's related to uh, providing, let's say, ebook readers or something, some other sort of technology, uh, you better make sure that it is accessible to uh, visually impaired and to other folks. If, for example, you were going to be uh, acquiring some public access computers, let's say, you better make sure that there's software on there, such as the software that was demonstrated during the BTOP grants that uh, provides large type, that provides voice output, that provides other things so that you do make them, them accessible so that you uh, are ADA compliant with that. Sound good? Sounds good. Right. I didn't realize that myself. So yeah, that's, good information. well, this is federal money. And in fact, when you look at those suits that were brought before or uh, for these two libraries, they specifically mentioned that these things were purchased with federal funds. ADA is, is required on the, with federal funds, so you don't have a choice here. All right, let me see. Let's talk about the priority for the Pioneer Consortium. And I'm gonna go through a couple of documents. We did put a link up here, not to the main page for the Pioneer Consortium, but to the membership page so that you could see this. I wanna draw this to your attention. The 21 public libraries and the uh, one community college library that are part of the uh, membership of the consortium right now are listed there at the beginning, but it's the five of the documents below there that I'm going to go through uh, step by step, not in great detail because you can read these uh, all yourself, but I do want to point out that these documents will be useful for you if you decide to apply for a library improvement grant for joining the library consortium. This is useful information, and there'll be other information sent to your library shortly after this presentation I'll mention to you as well. This first one has to do with steps to membership. Most of these, I think, were written by uh, Steve Fosselman, who is at uh, Grand, the library director at Grand Island Public Library. His library is now acting as the fiscal agent for the consortium for these libraries, uh, working with the national company, PTFS, that provides the software and modifies the software for the consortium. So here's information about how to gain membership within the consortium itself. They'll send a letter to Steve Fosselman as the business agent. They'll fill out an application and assurances form. The executive board of the Pioneer Consortium, which is made up of four people, five people, I believe, will approve your membership. You'll execute a joint entity agreement, and that joint entity agreement is basically something like a, a like an interlocal agreement that would be signed between your village board or city council and the consortium itself. You would pay uh, an initiation fee, initial fee, orientation fee. You would have to review and clean up your bibliographic records. And most libraries, before they either join, uh, decide to uh, automate their collection or they're moving over from a different automation system, will probably do some heavy weeding before they do that because there's a charge per bibliographic record, per bib record, as they're called, so if, is this, you want to get rid of some stuff, this is a good time to do it. Pioneer will send you a quote for what this is going to cost. And uh, you can use that quote either for this library improvement grant, or you'll see later on there's actually uh, a tool with on the uh, Pioneer Consortium website where you can actually do an estimate of what it would cost you. And that is sufficient as far as the commission is concerned for determining what your costs will be to join the Pioneer Consortium. Then you'd work with uh, Pioneer and with PTFS, the company I already mentioned that uh, works on the software for a schedule for when you will migrate over to the new system. And then you'll work with other Pioneer members already 
in place, and we'll talk about that later on since we have a couple of Pioneer members who are happy to show you how this works. Next one we'll go to is basic membership costs. This gives you a good idea of what the costs will be. The initiation fee, which I mentioned, or the initial fee. <clears throat> the number, uh, the amount that you're charged for bib records is based on how large the collection is that you're going to migrate. Hang on a minute. The cost for data loading and for deduping of those records so that uh, if there's already a record for that one particular book in the in the consortium, <clears throat> it's not listed again. There's one initial, one uh, central record for that. <clears throat> there's a first year maintenance fee. And this is uh, an estimate that Steve put together based on if you had 10,000 bib records in your collection. A number of our libraries that are smaller, let's say 500 or under population, usually have smaller collections than that. So you'll base it on the size of your collection. There's an annual membership assessment that goes to PTSF LiveLine, which is the, uh, the, the it's kind of nomenclature or the name that they use, but PTFS is this company. And um, the, the this offers, I think, enough information for you to look at this whole thing and to talk to your library board or your administration if you're a state-run institution about this whole thing. Let's go to the next one. Richard, if they have questions oh, sorry. about the, the money that mm -hmm. you were saying and, they're, and they've done some figuring here, um, would, they, would it be wise for them to contact you or Steve? Call Fossilman? Steve Fosselman because okay, I'll good. be reviewing the grants as well as oh, other people right. here. So there is Steve Fosselman's contact address. There's his email and his phone number. Um, Feel free to call him. He is the business agent. He sits with the uh, executive board and uh, brings documents together and so forth for the continue or the uh, uh, consideration of the board. Thank you. Sure. Just, I would have wanted to contact somebody before I determined that was the right number. Right. Well, here's the document that you might use with your board or with your administration if you're talking, if you're trying to convince them that you might want to join the Pioneer Consortium. This is uh, a document that uh, Steve put together to give you some idea of costs involved. And what he did was, which is really useful, is that instead of just giving you an estimate about what it would cost the first year, because the first year costs are going to be higher because you're pulling in all your bib records, and in subsequent years you're going to be pulling in fewer numbers of bibliographic records after that. But for the initial sort of thing, there'll be a higher cost the first year. He actually has shown you how to estimate what your costs will be over a seven-year period. And that makes good sense because it'll show you not just what happens the first year, but then you can plan for your budgets for subsequent years. Now, if your library were to be uh, lucky enough to receive a library improvement grant, much of the cost, up to 75% of the cost, uh, could be covered by the library improvement grant. So that first year um, hit that you're going to take would be somewhat softened by the library improvement grant. In fact, quite a bit softened by it. So look at that. That'll give you a good idea of how the cost estimates are done. And then there's actually the estimator itself, which is a tool that will show you. Um, you'll just feed in some information here, which we'll see. You'll feed in your legal service area, LSA. That comes from, you know what that is from us here at the commission your total operating revenue, your holdings, and the total circulation. Now, I'm going to double check this to make sure because you know that for those of you in public libraries who send in your annual statistical survey, which of course you'd have to be doing because you have to be an accredited library, I want to double check to make sure that those uh, sections of the annual survey that you do are the correct numbers there. We'll double check that to make sure before you, before you do this. When you fill those things out, then uh, there's another thing that you can fill out if you wish to. If you want some on-site technology or tech consulting, you can uh, also put in $500 into your budget, which will be figured, and then this will calculate what your costs are going to be. It's a really handy thing. So what you saw on the previous uh, slide was a kind of a, a demo. This will be the one that actually is for your library itself. Okay, Sally, how do I go back? Do I just close this sucker? Yes. Okay, I don't want to lose it. Great, and close this. Okay. And finally, I want to show you the ease of use. 
which is something that you can use to justify uh, the purchasing of this software and uh, joining the consortium if you wish to. Um, I won't go through all of these. You can read that on your own. I think it's very easy to read. And again, uh, contact information is there for Steve Fosselman. Now, the one thing I'm not reviewing today, although it is there, is that there are withdrawal procedures. In case you are a member and you wish to withdraw in, in the future, there are some details there about how that has to happen. There certainly are some costs involved because there has to be a, a taking out of records from your library, and there's some costs involved. But we hope that nobody will have to do that in the future. Uh, anyway, that's the information on the Pioneer Consortium website. And um, I do want to point out that there are two public libraries right now that are offering to demo this software if you're interested. They are Central City Public Library. And I think I sent out information to all of our public libraries. And I will be sending that to the uh, 11 institutional or 12 institutional libraries as well. But Central City Public Library will demonstrate this software if you're interested in seeing how it works on Wednesday, January 6, from 10 to 2, and on Wednesday, January 20, from 10 to 2. And since that offer was made, and that Sarah Lee sent that in. I thought that was nice. She's actually a member of the, of the uh, Pioneer Board right now. But also Vicki Perry from Superior Public Library said that she'd be willing to demonstrate the software any afternoon if you'd like to contact her, but please call ahead of time. In the case of the ones at uh, uh, Central City Public Library, if you want to just show up between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Wednesday, January 6, or on Wednesday, January 20, if they're willing to show you how that works. So we thank them for that. Sure. You can also, of course, look at the list of other Pioneer Consortium members, and if you're closer to them, you might call up and say, hey, can I come and see how it works? All right? All right, let me get to my next sheet here. If you have questions about the Pioneer Consortium, you can contact Steve Fosselman, or you can contact um, Laureen Riesel, who is the current president at Beatrice Public Library, or you can contact me if you've got some questions, and I'll kick you over to those folks or someone else if I can't answer those questions. All right, now we'll be sending out a mass mail to all of your libraries uh, after this is over, from the Pioneer uh, Library Consortium. I don't think I can show this on camera, but there's a multi-sheet thing that's coming out. It's nice and colorful. We won't try to come in on it, but it's, it's December 2015 membership invitation from them. And that has much more detail on this whole thing, which you may like to read. All right. Watch for it. OK, now let's get back to the. Uh, Library Improvement Grants here. I want to go back to that. And let's see. You can go up to the house at the top. And then I want to get to, I think I can just do it from here. I want to get to the oh, grant application form here. The grant application form is online. It is um, quite a bit different from any application form we've ever had before. And the reason it is, is because it is now compliant with how we have to report to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. That is the federal organization that provides the LSTA federal monies to us to distribute to you. So this is quite a change, and I'm going to try to go through this for you. But please um, Reserve your judgment on this until we get to the end and until you review it a few times, because it's it's really uh, quite a bit different. Um, I want to go through this and tell you a few different things that may be useful to you before we actually go through the process. We've been working very closely with the core, with the system directors, system administrators in our four regional library systems because, in fact, <clears throat> they had to send in their long-range plans to us using uh, a new approach. And the new approach uses 
what you will see embodied in this application as well. So they could be very helpful to you as you fill out these application forms. Um, Scott Childers from uh, Southeast Library System and um, Sharon Osenga, who's co-director of Central Plains Library System, actually were looking at what we were talking about, uh, the new way of, of doing uh, their long range plans. They came up with the something and Scott said, you know, this is just sort of like learning a new vocabulary. That's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be doing a vocabulary lesson to you. And and uh, Sharon said something interesting as well. Sharon Osenga said, you know, this is sort of like an outline format. And I think you'll see that as we go through. It's not strictly an outline format, but you will see that um, when we look at this, that we'll, we'll come back to this after we go through it to show this. In fact, maybe what I think I'll do is, in fact, before we do it, I think I'll show these two links. No, well, this, way. this way, this way. Yeah. Just go up to that one. All right, let me show you something here. I'll minimize that. Um, this is what I'm calling, this is the one that I like better because it's not so graphic, it's more verbal, and I'm better with verbal than graphic, but there are two things I'm going to show you here, this one and then a sort of graphic one. But the verbal one is like this, and I'm going to just go through this quickly because you'll see how this is reflected on the application form itself. Um, the LSTA purposes, there were five of those. Remember I showed those to you? Those are the ones you're going to be looking at. And then within the application itself, you're going to see that there is a project intent. What's the intention of your project? Is it for lifelong learning? Is it for information access? Is it for increasing the capacity of your library? Is it for economic and employment development? Is it for human services or civic engagement? And these will make a bit more sense when you see how these are broken out on the application form itself. Now, these are all sort of subdivisions of the stuff above, kind of, but not exactly. So that's why I don't want to mix you up. It's not a perfect outline form, but they do all relate to each other. After you decide, determine what the project intent is that you're going to have for your, for your grant application, then you're going to look at what activities you're going to be involved in. Are you procu or procuring something? Are you getting something? Are you doing some planning or evaluation? Are you uh, acquiring some content? Are you doing some instruction in this particular LSTA project? Then you need to talk about who's going to benefit from this. Is this the general population? Is it every age group? Is it everybody in your community? Or is it are there targeted groups? If they're targeted groups, we'll show you some age groups and some other groups to look at that you want to choose from. What's the format of the activity that you're going to be doing in this grant activity? If you're going to be acquiring something, let me take a drink here. If you're going to be acquiring the, uh, the, uh, uh, come on, what system am I talking about? I was just oh, talking Pioneer? about the Pioneer system. That probably fits under procurement. So you don't have to go to some of these other sections. But the other sections have different divisions. Like if you're doing some planning and evaluation, are you doing prospective or retrospective planning or evaluation? In other words, are you looking back or are you looking forward? That's what those stand for. If, you're, if your activity uh, has to do with content, are you talking about acquisition? Are you acquiring materials? Are you creating content, perhaps online? Uh, What's the description of what you're doing? Are you going to be lending things? Are you going to be doing some preservation? So those are all sorts of divisions of the content of, oops, I don't want to do that. Are you doing instruction? Are you, are you doing a program? Are you doing presentation or performance? Are you doing consultation or drop in or referral? All of these things relate, if you go back and back and back and back and back to what your, what your intent is of the whole thing. And then, you'll have to list what the expectations are of your project outcomes. And finally, we'll get to the project budget. Now, that's kind of a verbal sort of thing. I'm more comfortable with that. But for people who are more comfortable with graphic sorts of things, this isn't as detailed as the verbal one. But this might give you an idea of here we're dealing with the LSTA program. You're, done, you're going to be dealing with a project. What's your project? What is the intent of that project? What activities are you going to have in that project? 
What is the mode by which you're going to deliver it? What's the format? What's the, uh, does that say quantity? Yes. <laughs> quantity, you can't read it. Okay. Uh, partner. Partners? Partners. Partners. And who are the beneficiaries? And finally, what does that say? Locale. Right? Locale. Locale. What's the locale you're going to be doing? Sorry, my eyesight's getting bad as I get older. So those are two ways of looking at how you might describe your project. And once we get back to the application form itself, can I just minimize this? Yeah, but before you do that, yes. um, Krista will put these two forms, will attach it to the um, presentation. presentation. Yes. So if you want to see these later, you'll be able to access them from the from the um, archived Thank section. Thank you, Sally. Thanks for pointing that out. Krista will be back tomorrow. That's why Sally's Yay. here today. So Krista could be on vacation. All right, I'll minimize this. No, I didn't want to do that. Oh, well, now you just call up and you know, the next one over. This one? Yeah, that guy. Thank so, you very much. You All right. Okay. I want to go here to the actual application form itself. Can I blow this up a little bit even though it yeah. blows me off the screen? Sure. Okay, good. Because you didn't need to see me in the corner anyway. All yeah. right. Let's go then to the online application form itself. Um, this is an interactive online form. Why is it so different? I already explained that a little bit. Um, it's different because there are 50 state library agencies. All of them receive LSTA money. Everyone was reporting their LSTA program reports to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, however they wanted to report it. Comparability was an impossible situation. So what the Institute of Museum and Library Services, or IMLS, has been doing over the last several years is that they've been having those of us who deal with the LSTA funds come to meetings, and they have beaten into our heads for <laughs> years a different approach to this whole thing. This I thought they were just appealing to your... Oh, no. It was, there were beatings. <laughs> there were beatings. They fed us well, too, but there oh, were also good. beatings. It was a sort of, you know, good cop, bad cop kind of situation. Anyway. Uh, what we have done with the with the library improvement grant applications this year, which of course are for those LS, LSTA general, uh, federal funds, is that we are following their guidelines about how to do this. This is the first year we're doing this. I don't think it's going to flop totally, but my guess is that for the funds for next year, there's going to be some changes in this whole thing. It's but possible. this is what it looks like this year. The form itself begins with a part that you've got to fill out, your name, your library, phone number, email address, city, project director, and your zip code. Then we get into the LSTA purposes. Now, this is a reflection of those five purposes that we saw, we showed to you earlier that are listed on our website. They're now in this application form itself. This application form itself, when you are through with it, you will send in to us it will allow you to print off a copy for yourself, and you'll send it to us, and three people at the commission will receive that. I'll receive a copy, uh, Linda will receive a copy, and Vern will receive a copy. So we got three people here who will be getting these application forms. You'll receive a message that we received it. So everybody will be happy to know that their application form went in because it's electronic, so we can do that. I have to give a whole bunch of credit to Vern Bias, who is our guru here of computers because he took my handwritten sorts of things oh, no, not and translated them into this form and believe me it was not easy because all the links and everything else are in here it's really phenomenal I've tried it out and it works really very slickly I like it now notice what it says here that you can choose one or more of the following please don't check all of them we don't want an application for LSTA money coming in that checks all of them because I mean, we have about maybe $100,000, but we also have 12 institutional libraries and about 150 accredited public libraries that could apply for this. So you can't have all the money, even if you want to. So choose wisely. Choose the category that you think is most appropriate for the project that you're talking about. And when you do that, you'll click on it, and it'll show up. 
or you can click on another one. If you really feel that the two are equally yeah. important, that's sure. okay. Sure, that's fine. Once you start clicking all of them, we start thinking, yeah. this is way too strong. Let's broad. send this puppy back and get it more focused, yes. Now, the project intent. In each of these sections, we have definitions for you. Please accept the fact that you probably will not understand the definition the first two or three times you read it. That's okay. Read it again and read it again. In fact, I would recommend you go through the whole application form itself before you ever try to fill it out. I think that would be foolish. Look at the whole thing first. Because I'm assuming, Richard, that you've read through the definitions quite a few times in the course of going to these meetings and talking with other librarians. About I dream them. about them, Sally. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Some good dreams, some nuts are good dreams. But read through these. The project intent. I'm going to read these to you just so you hear it verbally, and then you can read it on your own afterward. The, the intent is the objective, the intended result, or the outcome of your project. Then notice you're only going to choose one of the following 13 boxes. The boxes themselves are, are kind of their categories here, but only choose one from the whole list. So you'll fill out one of these bubbles like this. You just click on it and it fills it in. Not more than one. If you click on another one, that first one will disappear. Okay? So that's all you can choose is one. What is the intent of your project? What's the objective, intended result, or outcome that you're planning? So let's read through those. Under lifelong learning, you want to improve users' formal education, or do you want to improve users' general knowledge and skills? So focus it. These will help you focus. If you know that information access is what you want to do, do you want to improve the user's ability to discover information resources, or do you want to improve their ability to obtain and use information resources? So discover or obtain and use, slightly different. Be careful about what you're choosing. This will help you focus your plan, too, or your, your project. <clears throat> Institutional capacity. Do you want to improve your library's physical or technological infrastructure, or do you want to improve library operations? So you have to choose. Under economic and employment development, do you want to improve your user's ability to use resources and apply information for employment support? Or do you want to improve user's ability to use and apply business resources? Now, these are not chosen willy-nilly. These actually are taken from the federal law that applies to LSTA money, LSTA, LSTA money, sorry, I flipped back, and they are they are priorities that are chosen by the feds. And we have uh, further uh, narrowed those priorities to include these within this list here. For human services, do you want to improve the user's ability to apply information that furthers their personal, family, or household finances? So there's one you might be interested in. Or do you want to choose one that applies to those people's personal or family health and wellness? Or one that applies to their parenting and family skills? These are very specific. So your, your application should be, and what you intend to do, should uh, home in on those things. And finally, civic engagement. Do you want to improve the user's ability to participate in their community or to participate in their community conversations around topics of concern? Those are slightly different, so choose. All right? Just one out of those 13. Just one out of those 13. So you need this will help you focus what it is that you're doing. Now, activity. Now, here's a whole bunch of definitions, which we're going to spend a little bit of time on, because we're talking about mode and activity. And some of those are a little bit strange. It has taken years for the feds to drum some of these definitions into my head, but I think I finally sort of have them. Once I'm glad in a while, they didn't give up. They didn't give up. <laughs> they knew some of us were thick-headed, and they had to keep beating it into us. So here they are. You can always go back and review these. So an activity is an action or actions through which the intent of the project is accomplished. What do we look at up above? Oh, project intent. There's the tie-in. OK, so you better choose an activity, and you better choose a mode that really relates back to. All this stuff relates step by step, all right? An activity accounts for at least 10% of the total amount of resources committed to the project. In other words, if you've got some activity that is less than 10%, you don't need to try to mention it in here. It may be part of the project, but we're looking for major things that you're talking about. It'd be better if it were more than 10%, quite a bit more than 10%. 
so you don't have to have everything, mm -mm. but just the major points. You're going to find out this is going to force you to make choices, and I'll tell you about that at the very end, force you to make choices that normally you don't have to make. You can really be, and I love this because I was an English major, I love to write whole lots of words and descriptions. <laughs> This is not allowing you to do that. Okay. This is really crunching it down to you have to make choices on stuff. So an activity accounts for at least 10% of the total resources committed to this project. That's not 10% of what you're asking for. That's 10% of the total resources, your local resources, the resources of this grant. Okay. Choose only one. Notice how we underlined. Only one of the four activity areas below to indicate the primary activity of your project. Then you can choose one or more modes or for the activity, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. There's a definition. A mode is the characteristic of an activity. Now, honest to goodness, I have gone to at least three, maybe four workshops, and I think I understand mode and activity and intent and all that sort of thing, but you really have to... It really helps to go back and review them. That's why we put these definitions at the beginning of each of these sections. And we'll keep these definitions here because there could be a new person next year who's looking at these and saying, what the heck are you talking about? So there's the definition of mode. A mode is a characteristic of an activity. Well, then you have to see what activity is. You see how these link together? Okay. It's going to take a little vocabulary lesson for a while, but believe me, they make sense. I've had these beaten into my head for at least three years, maybe more, and they do hang together and make sense. So a mode is a characteristic of an activity. Okay, here we want you to choose what activity you're going to be doing. Are you going to be doing procurement? For example, those uh, libraries that are doing um, that are doing Pioneer may choose this because they're they're getting some hardware software. Well, if you, if you choose that one, you don't have to worry about some of the other things involved in here because it's not appropriate for that. But if you choose planning and evaluation, which, again, it defines it there, involves design, development, and assessment of operations, services, or resources, what's the mode? When the information is collected, analyzed, and or disseminated, choose one or more of these. So you have to see this in a couple different pieces. It's sort of a multifaceted thing. If you're doing planning and evaluation, which involves these things, design development or assessment, then which mode are you going to be looking at? Are you going to be looking at a retrospective mode? In other words, looking at the past involves the historical assessment or condition of a project or services. Are you looking back and evaluating what you've got? Or are you doing a prospective one? Are you doing research that involves assessment of future condition of a program or services? And those are two very different things. But you could be doing them both. You could be doing a review that looks back, and you could at the same time for this project be looking forward at the same time. That's very possible. That's a, that's a larger project. It's more intense. But you can choose both of those if you wish to. All right. Let's talk about another one, another activity. This is... Uh, Planning and evaluation. No, we just did that. This is content, which involves acquisition, development, or transfer of information. So we tried to put these definitions in wherever they are. The mode, how the information is made accessible. Choose one or more. Are you looking at acquisition, creation, description, lending, or preservation? For acquisition, are you talking about selecting, ordering, or receiving materials for the library? which may also include procuring software or hardware for the purpose of storing or retrieving information or interacting with that information. For example, the, if you are applying for, uh, for a Pioneer grant, you could perhaps put it under procurement, but you could also put it under acquisition according to this definition. So make, make your choice. Under mode, are you talking about creation? Are you, are you going to do design or production of an information tool for resources, which includes digitization or the process of converting data to digital format for processing by a computer? I'm not going to read all of these to you because you can read them. I mean, they're all up here on the screen. <clears throat> are you doing description of that comment, of that content? And there's the definition. Are you talking about lending? Are you talking about preservation? 
then read those definitions. So that's all under content. The reason I'm not reading all these is that we have about 10 till. I want to keep going through. What about instruction? Are you looking at instruction for the activity? That involves interaction for knowledge or a skill transfer. How is that learning going to be delivered or experienced? You can choose one or more. Are you going to be doing a program? Are you going to talk about presentations in your library? Are you going to provide consultation or drop-in or referral to for this particular project? So choose one or more of those. They might be one, two, or three if you want to, although I would think you might want to focus a bit more on the doing all three. Let's go to the beneficiaries. Who are the beneficiaries of this grant that you're asking for? Definition of beneficiaries are the people who will use, visit, participate, or otherwise experience a project activity. Indicate who will benefit from this project. Choose one of those listed below as the primary beneficiary. Notice we want you to choose one. Is it the general population or is it a targeted group? If you choose general population here, then you won't have to come down here and choose from this list because you're hitting everybody. But you can do all ages if you want to. If you have a targeted group of the beneficiary, is it in an urban area, suburban area, or rural area? If you have a targeted group activity, choose uh, the group that is going to be hit for this. Is it all of those? If it's all ages, hit all ages. If it's specific, uh, specific to seniors, then maybe you want to hit 50, 60, 70 plus. If it's specific to younger kids, you might want to hit zero through five, whatever it is that's appropriate. If the activity is directed in, at one or more of those groups, uh, at one or more of those above, then what's the economic situation? And you can select one or more of those. Is it for people living below the poverty line, for the unemployed, or is this applicable for what we're talking about? This is helping you focus on groups that you're going to be meeting the needs of, and it helps us understand what it is you're proposing. Now, if the activity is, is focused at an ethnic or minority population, indicate one or more of these in here, or click it's not applicable. If the activity is directed at families, hit yes. If it's directed at inter intergenerational groups, not including families, hit yes. The reason you don't include, uh, you don't hit it again, is because you've already covered that up above, the families up above. It's, if it's directed at immigrants or refugees, hit, hit yes. If it's directed to those with disabilities, yes. Those with limited functional literacy or information skills, yes or no. And is it directed at groups that fall into a category not already listed, yes or no. If it's yes, then you list the groups there. The reason for these groups is that they are all target groups of this federal money. That's why those questions are being asked. All right, format. Talk, us, talk to us about what the activity is going to be. Now we're talking about format and mode. Here are some new definitions again. A format is a characteristic of a mode. A mode is, as you, as you choose in question three above, because this re relates back to question three, then indicate which formats you're going to be choosing here. So we'll go back to question three for just a minute. And I want to keep going farther, because this is activity. Notice that a mode is a characteristic of an activity. See how these all tie together? Not, not clearly the first time you read this, honestly. You need to go back and review this. You may even want to print this out and take it home for homework and look at it. But don't a format dream is, about it, though. A format, no, don't dream about it like I do. A format is characteristic of the mode. Use the same mode or modes as you chose in question three above and indicate which formats the, the project will be using. That procurement is not applicable for this, but if you're looking at planning and evaluation, then you would choose whether it is Prospective or retrospective, you mean, remember there were, you can look back or look forward as far as your collection goes. Well, is this in-house, you're going to do a prospective sort of study, or are you going to bring a third-party vendor in? And the same for retrospective. How about content? Are you looking at digital, physical, or, or all of them, combined digital and physical? How about creation? This is, this is the format. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but these will honestly make sense if you go through these and look back at what you indicated above. They all relate to each other. Now, instruction, again, uh, you can be doing programs, presentation or performance, or consultation, drop-in, referral. Remember, those are the programs that are listed above under this particular activity. But are you going to do virtual, in-person, or a combined? 
The same for presentation or performance, the same for consultation and drop in. Then you get to project outcomes. And I know I'm ripping through this. And honestly, we'll have to look at it and look over it several times. We want to know what outcomes you anticipate from this project. In other words, and for those of you who have done uh, anything before, what difference is the project going to make? If you can't answer the question, what difference is the project going to make, maybe you shouldn't be applying for it. So what are those outcomes? What methods are you going to use to get to those outcomes? Are you going to survey the people you served? Or are you going to do it through observation of the people? Are you going to review data that you gathered? Are you going to do focus groups or interviews of people or use some other way? Uh, do you anticipate continuing this after the, the current reporting period ends? In other words, the money runs out that you're getting? Are you going to anticipate uh, continuing it or not? Do you anticipate any changes you're going to make? I hope that if you do one of these LSTA funded projects that you learn something and maybe you'll change the scope of the project. Do you anticipate any changes in the project, uh, in, in the project itself and in the scope of the project? Those two kind of relate to each other. And there's the whew, at the very end. It's going to feel like that to you the first time you do this. I want to go just briefly to the through the budget here. I was going to fill in some things because it is interactive, but I'm not going to do that because I want to see if we have any questions. But you'll notice that as you put things in here, let's suppose I put $100 in here. Where's, where's the draw? Yeah, $100 in here. Oops, that won't work. There's my backspace, backspace, backspace. Oh, let me put it down here. Let me put it. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me put it down here. $100. You'll notice that when you click, it appears over there under the total funds also. So this is all related to each other. What I say down here, note, is that usually it is not allowable to count personnel costs as part of your match that is required for this. Remember, you need a 25% match. At least 10% of that match is, is funding. Usually not allowable unless you can show that you are actually going to dedicate some staff time to this project and you have to pull them off what they're doing and do that. So then you can count it. But generally, it's not that. Now, everybody ought to be able to come up with 10% of a cash match. So for like the Pioneer Grant, if you could indicate that a, a one or two staff members are dedicated to weeding the collection as part of that process. Yes, that you can happen? make that case. Absolutely, you can Thank make you. that case. Absolutely, that's a good one. Once you're done, you're going to save and submit the whole application. What you're going to find is that um, uh, it will come back to you to allow you to print it. And then uh, we will have three copies, as I indicated earlier, of people who will get the application forms here. We'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Notice the due date, <clears throat> 11.59 p.m. Central Time on January 28, 2016. If it's later than that, we won't look at it. There will be a list of applications that have been submitted as they come in. Uh, you will have to send in your Internet safety certificate if you need to separately. And there will be some other documents that we send you as well. The, the Internet safety documentation, does that have to be in here by the, the 20? Not, necess well, not necessarily, but, but, but at least shortly thereafter, because we have a crew of people who are going to be looking at these things. Okay. Do we have any questions that have come in? Not on here All right. yet. But maybe I just happen to be asking the questions. That That's you're fine. Asked. That's fine. It could be. And if they put in this this, um, this budget form, if they put in their amounts, but the percentages don't come up right, does it indicate that? It does not. But not we'll okay. be back in touch with you right away. Okay. Because we'll you have to meet. Out. You have to meet that. Yeah. The other thing that's not part of this, as you look at our website, it's still not part of it. Is that we will be. Um, we will be doing a final report that is not in here yet, but you will have to submit. I just haven't had time to do that yet, but that final report will have to come in after the project is finished as well. And is that due roughly a year? Yeah, uh, it has to be in so that we can use it. We'll, on the report oh. form itself, we'll indicate when that will come. We'll put that up on our website as well. Okay. It is now 11 o'clock. So are there any more, any questions? Um, remember that uh, Krista will be back tomorrow and she will post both last week's um, Encompass Live session and today's Encompass Live sessions up on our archive so you can sure come back and look at it again and and the um, she'll add those in yes she'll add in the um, 
PowerPoint pages that Richard showed us. And you can sure look at everything again. Zoom to that special section where you want to hear again what he was talking about on the archive, which is one of the handy things about looking at it that way. And feel free to call me anytime, our 800 number. And that number is 800 307 2665. Oh, you're so good, I just Sally. I happen to know that. You're so good, Sally. Okay. And if we take, can I, may I take Yes, over? please. Please do. I would just like to show you, let's see, the page. This is also nice because if you've been filling in information and suddenly you go, um, what? <laughs> it really asks you before you head out. Now let's see. Let's see if I can. Would you type in Encompass Life? Sure. Does it have to be capital Life? Yeah. So I can go to the. Okay. That's good. Space Life? No. We're good. You got it? We're okay. Good. Isn't that great that, that you can type it in and then your, your best bet right there? Here are the upcoming Encompass Live sessions. So next week, I'll be back talking about. The presentation I gave at conference in October, what I'm calling the best new children's books of 2015, and then the other scheduled Encompass Lives after that. And as you look at these, right down here underneath that list is the archived Encompass Live <laughs> sessions that you can access for any of the presentations that have been given in the how many years has it been? I'm not sure. Well, Chris has been here... I'm going to say nine, nine or, or six. Ten. Yeah, she's been doing it for a know. long time. Oh, anyway, <clears throat> and they're all chronological. So, um, Sally, may I mention one more thing? Yes. We will be sending out to all accredited public libraries and to those uh, institutional libraries that I mentioned earlier a copy of the Pioneer uh, Consortium information that I mentioned. That will go out today, uh, barring any kind of electrical storm, but I think that would be going out today for your information. So you can look at that and read it at your convenience. But remember, as you said, that the applications are due January 28th, just before midnight, because it's electronic, we can say that. Did and we say, what time did we say? I think we, we said, said just before, I don't know. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you. I'm thinking. So I still don't see any questions. I'm sure people are just absorbing all this information you've given them. And I bet they're stunned. <laughs> no, <laughs> Not in a good way. They'll be calling you next, <laughs> next week after the new year when things start to settle in. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you attending our conference today or looking at it on the archive sessions. Happy New Year. Get your apps in. Yes, and we hope to see you next week as well. Thank you.